My lectures have come to possess a feature that uh, belonged to many of my sermons when I was preaching twice every Lord's Day. It's called the to be continued later feature. <laughs> uh, I often found it j simply too difficult to exegete and deal with two separate passages so that the evening would be a continuation of the morning. I had planned these lectures to spill over the way they have. There are four themes that would have been preferable if each lecture had covered each theme. Uh, obviously, that hasn't happened. The third lecture is entitled, The Pastor with His Sermon. And I really hope I can get there because <laughs> I first have to complete the second lecture uh, having to do with the pastor with himself. And we dealt with his, the necessity of his communion with Christ. We've talked a little bit about the necessity of doing battle with remaining sin. I want to touch upon one remaining point, and that has to do with taking heed against crippling discouragement. We're operating from Paul's challenge to Timothy to take heed to yourself. And I want to challenge you uh, to be on guard against crippling discouragement. I think discouragement is almost inevitable in the work of the ministry. Regardless of your temperament, uh, I think it is part of the stratagem of our enemy. But it can become paralyzing. It, it can become damaging. So I want to talk. I, I'm afraid I have more experimental acquaintance with this subject than I wish. Counsel for combating crippling discouragement. First, let me try to describe the problem. You're all familiar, no doubt, with Elijah's unexpected swooning fit. After his wonderful triumphs on Mount Carmel. In order to understand or try to understand what, what happened to the great prophet Elijah, Perhaps we ought to go back and think about what he had been doing. Elijah brashly and boldly called out the 450 prophets of Baal. And he challenged them to a prophesying contest. Now the objective, of course, was not to see who was the most skilled to prophesying. The objective was to determine who was telling the truth, who was representing the only true living God. Now, we should not imagine that Elijah was the least bit apprehensive about the outcome of that contest, as evidenced by his holy taunting. I'm a sports enthusiast. But I am so glad that the NCAA and various pro leagues have instituted penalties for taunting. I hate it. Well, Elijah did some big time taunting. Maybe you need to cry out loud to your God. Maybe he's taking a nap. Maybe he's relieving himself. I, you cry a little louder, try a little harder. He was taunting them. And that was a reflection, of course, of the indignity that they would dare to represent a rival to the only true and living God. He was incensed. But he was also very confident that his God was the true God. So that particular experience, that challenge, that was not a trial for Elijah. But Elijah was a true human being. And as such, he would have experienced all of the normal rigors 
that our humanity is subject to. There would have been a powerful adrenaline rush uh, on Mount Carmel. But then he also expended a great deal of physical energy, building an altar, killing and preparing the sacrifice, preaching, executing 450 false prophets. And then, if all these things happen on the same day, interceding with God for rain and waiting and interceding again and repeating that over and over again until the appearance of the storm clouds. And then he outran Ahab's chariot from Mount Carmel to Jezreel about 10 miles. That's a pretty full Lord's Day. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty full day. Now, what triumphs Elijah witnessed? God did astounding things. We're still talking about what God did. God wonderfully used him. It was not a sad occasion. It was a triumphant occasion, but it would have been depleting to his humanity. It would have been exhaustive. But then, part of the mix for Elijah was that his triumphs, God's triumphs through him, stirred the wrath of wicked Queen Jezebel and brought her pledged to have him assassinated within 24 hours. Now, you wouldn't think that that would trouble a guy who has just uh, seen fire fall out of heaven, who's just executed 450 of his rivals. You would think that the threats of a wicked queen wouldn't bother him. But he was an exhausted man at that point. He had been on the highest of highs. He was physically exhausted. He was emotionally exhausted. And his response to the threats of Queen Jezebel, shock everyone. That is, everyone who hasn't engaged in public ministry for very long. 1 Kings 19.4, Elijah himself, when a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. I wonder how many pastors have said that. It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Now, to be sure, it would be presumptuous for us to compare what we experienced with what Elijah experienced on this occasion but there are some points of commonality. Though our experience is much inferior, there are some points of commonality, and I think perhaps it's wise for us to touch upon those. For one thing, we, like Elijah, share a, a very frail, sin-weakened humanity. Our humanity is much weaker than we think it is. It's been weakened in every part, physically, mentally, emotionally. And we have to live with that. It's not going to get better. We may learn more and we may grow in grace, but our humanity is failing us. Our memories, our resilience, our emotional resilience is being worn down. In close connection with that, there is a mysterious interplay between the soul and the body. And I, I know there, are, there have been studies on that, and it's one of the mysteries. It's one of the mysteries of God's creation. We are body and we are soul. How are they connected? At what point are they connected? In what way are they connected? I can't explain that, except that the phenomena is real. It's my experience that intense, high-energy, spiritual labor weakens my body. 
going through a, a three or four hour elders meeting or a two and a half hour counseling session uh, exhausts me physically. Now why? What have I done physically? Well, I've talked a lot perhaps, but apart from that, what have I done physically? It's been spiritual labor, intense spiritual labor, and it weakens the body. But it also seems to me that high energy work, whether it's actual physical work, chopping down trees, laying bricks, or a rigorous workout in the gym, which tends to break down the body, but it invigorates the spirit. I don't get to the gym as much as I would like, quite obvious. <laughs> but when I go, I often go feeling I cannot, I cannot work out. I am absolutely exhausted. But I really wasn't. It was mental. It was spiritual. And after a 45-minute vigorous workout, I come out feeling refreshed, energized. Now, how does that work? Spiritual labor exhausts the body. Physical labor invigorates the soul. I don't know. Preaching has a little bit of all those things mixed together. Preaching is, to be sure, high intensity, high energy, spiritual exertion. And varying from preacher to preacher, depending on your personality and style, for some, it's a physical workout as well. <laughs> so on a natural level, we are e exposing ourselves to a conflict when we preach. We're exhausting ourselves spiritually, but we're also exhausting ourselves physically, and yet the physical exhaustion tends to stimulate the spirit. So we're working spiritually, we're tearing down our bodies in terms of fatigue or feelings of fatigue, we're working physically and our spirits are being stimulated. So at the end of a Sunday, what are you? Well, I'm usually just a mess. <laughs> I'm physically exhausted, but my mind won't stop. My mind's going. It's, it's been energized, and my body uh, feels like it's going to collapse. And so often sleep comes at 2, 3 in the morning, on Monday mornings. There is a dynamic there that I don't know how you define or predict, but it's real. And it, it takes its toll over time. And, and that's why periodic breaks for the minister, uh, vacations, are, are not luxuries. They really are means of um, perseverance. But then beyond those dynamics, there is the multi-leveled opposition. Opposition to every effort we make to render meaningful service to Christ. Everything we do in deliberate service to Christ meets opposition. Our flesh resists. Our flesh doesn't want to focus on something outside of itself. The Christian ministry requires a very high level of self-denial. And our flesh always resists self-denial. Unless we're one of those people that can convince ourselves that self is actually served by self-denial. Now, we've rejected that, right? That austerity view of the Christian life. I'm actually saving myself by beating myself up. We reject that. Self-denial is for Christ's sake. It's not for our gain. It's for the cause of the gospel, but self pushes back. The flesh doesn't want to deny itself. So we find resistance in ourselves. Then, of course, Satan resists us at every point of our endeavor to magnify the glory and word and truth of Christ. As you well know, our warfare is spiritual and therefore it's mysterious. 
our ultimate enemy, our ultimate enemy has mastered the craft of shooting his fiery darts at our most vulnerable points. Now, Satan's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything about you. He doesn't know what you're thinking. But he observes you. He's been observing Christian ministers now for over 2,000 years. He knows how we function. He knows how we think. And he knows where we're vulnerable. And he's been watching you. And he knows how he can get at you. And he can get at you in ways that you don't know. You're vulnerable. Satan's devices are beyond our comprehension. We're really not going to outmaneuver him. But Christ is greater. And that's what we have to do. We have to run to our Savior, not try to counteract all that he's doing. We have to run to Christ. But it's wearying. And often a few of his fiery darts stick before we figure out we've been injured. And then... Of course, the opposition of people. This is probably the most difficult one for us. The opposition of people. Unregenerate people are rarely pleased by our exaltation of Christ. They don't rejoice to hear the gospel and how they must repent and die to self. I mean, it's good news, but they don't think it's good news. They think we have demeaned them, we've spoken down to them, we've exalted ourselves over them, they're offended, they're angered, and we feel a bit of self-pity. I'm just trying to save those wretched souls, and they're treating me as if I'm a malignancy in their lives. But what is most troubling is that sometimes genuinely regenerate people seem to be as offended as the unregenerate. And sometimes we can't figure that out. Why are you so offended at me? Where, where did that come from? I don't know how many times I've said that to my... Where did that come from? I did not see that coming. That happened to us as an eldership in the last two weeks. We had a family resign their membership, and we met together, and we said, did anybody see that coming? And there was a pastor who was meeting with those people regularly, and he said, I had no clue. The opposition to people is always disappointing. It's deflating. It would be wrong to say that Satan causes all the opposition that a gospel minister experiences, that would be wrong. Sometimes a gospel minister causes the opposition. But Satan does work through the opposition. Even when it's legitimate opposition, Satan is always there to interpret it and to use it against us. Now, I, I honestly hope that none of you would say what I'm about to say. But I've heard pastors actually say that the opposition of people to their ministries never bothers them. And I would be bold to say that those men should not be in the ministry. If they are so insensitive that the opposition of saint and sinner alike rolls off them like Teflon. They shouldn't be in the ministry. And there's only one man that I can really identify. I can see his face. I could call his name who, who made that boast. And I can say dogmatically, that man should never have been in the ministry. You know, part of what makes a gospel minister worth being a gospel minister is that Jesus Christ has softened his heart. And he has a tender heart. He doesn't want people to perish. He doesn't want people to misunderstand truth. He doesn't want God's people to suffer and to go into the wilderness. He doesn't want that. He yearns for people to be saved. He yearns for God's people to prosper. 
And, and whatever he gives them, he gives them because at least he thinks it will be good for their souls. And so when they reject, when they oppose, it wounds them. There's another factor that I think plays into our disappointment. And I'm not sure exactly how to phrase this. Some of us look and pray for radically transformational moments in ministry. We look and we pray for radically transformational moments, sermons, sermons which will produce some irreversible leaps forward in congregational sanctification. Watermark sermons. Pentecostal moments without the charismata. <laughs> now, honestly, I don't think that's bad. I, I think that we ought to preach with the hope and expectation that something wonderful is going to happen. That something fantastic is going to happen. That somebody's going to be converted. Some Christian is going to get beyond this, this mire that they've been in for a long time. The church is going, to, is going to move to a different level of spirituality. I, I think it's good to have those kind of expectations. I don't, I, I've never had anybody cry out in the middle of a sermon, what must I do to be saved? I have had some people stand up and prophesy in the middle of a sermon. That's interesting. That was not the response I was hoping for. It would be wonderful to have people cry out, Pastor, stop. You've got to tell me what to do to be saved. It'd be wonderful. If we preach with some level of desire, even expectancy for transformational moments. I think it's good, but it creates a problem, doesn't it? For one thing, there is not going to be such a transformational moment as will cure all the difficulties in the church. Now, we hope for that. You know, we want all the disappointments and conflicts and misunderstandings to be cleared away, and we'd like to preach a sermon and the Holy Spirit's just going to come and boom, everybody will be zapped, and we won't have those problems. Well, that's not going to happen. But how do we cope with the disappointment when revival doesn't come year after year after year? I thought about this recently, even in connection with preparing this. In the early years of my ministry, I preached a lot on revival. Wrote some articles for the old sword and trowel, preached at some preachers' conferences on revival. That was a major theme to me. Why? Because I thought it was coming. I thought the recovery of robust biblical Calvinism and the recovery of a biblically ordered church life, and I didn't even understand what that was, but I saw it coming over the horizon. I thought the days of Spurgeon would return. And if you haven't read or studied much on revival, I would urge you to do that. God has done some incredible things in history. And not so very long ago. Read the journals of George Whitfield. It's, it's a remarkable read. And it's, it's, amazing. it's good stuff to think and pray about. And I think we need, I think we need some vision for that kind of movement of the Spirit of God. It would be, it would be wonderful if we had more of a vision of that sort. But the thing that I realized, I haven't preached on revival in 20 years. Why? Oh, well, I'm a big boy now. Don't have dreams. No, I think it's, 
I don't think that's a, the answer. I think it's a bit of cynicism. That's not good. But sometimes the cynicism is a defense mechanism for dealing with having to live in a perpetual day of small things. When you want big things. And that can breed disappointment that, that's like uh, mildew building up in your soul. And then another cause of disappointment, and this is very autobiographical, and this may not apply to anyone else. I am often disappointed at the way I habitually react to the outcome of public ministry. Now, I don't like using the first person singular, but it would be a bit audacious for me to use first person plural because I don't know if you have this problem. If I struggle in preaching and almost no one seems to profit, I'm severely downcast. But you know what's worse? I don't know why I'm laughing. To think I've done a good job and no one seems to profit. You know when you've walked out of the study and you say, I think that's a home run. <laughs> I really do. I, I, I think that, that sermon, people will remember that sermon. And you preach, and you're at the door waiting for those <laughs> marvelous affirmations. Well, you feel like quitting. That was my best shot. <laughs> but then, what's even more troubling, if the sermon is well-received, and many profess to have been helped. How easily I'm puffed up and expect that the church will be named for me any day now. <laughs> Honestly, brothers, <clears throat> the most difficult, the most trying time for me is usually driving home after a sermon. Feeling either the misery of complete failure or a proud exhilaration that I've done something great. Both are wrong. And Satan can use both of them to eat away at our souls. There's nothing quite as embarrassing as to realize that you've been puffed up over something that you had no control over. Well, these are just some of the reasons for which many pastors are tempted, at least periodically, to fall into some level of disappointment, discouragement. Here's what I would hope we could come to grasp about discouragement. And I have a melancholic spirit, so I live, hey, I live in the neighborhood just about all the time. <laughs> So this was hard for me to actually admit. Discouragement, particularly severe, crippling discouragement, dishonors Christ. It disheartens God's people. It creates stumbling blocks to unbelievers. How can we advertise good news and be so cast down? It adds greatly to the burden of our wives. It confuses our children. And it places our own souls in a measure of jeopardy. So there are some very good reasons for working diligently to defeat discouragement. Now, all I've been doing is diagnosing the problem. The question is, what do we do? How do we fight? How do we overcome? How do we prevent? Well, let me suggest quickly, and you would think of all of these if you had a, 
a little time. Three very basic anecdotes to ministerial discouragement. There are many others, but these have been most helpful to me. Number one, understand the causes, see it coming. But beyond that, number one, Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins and for the sins of all of God's people. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. Nothing is so discouraging as our own personal sins. And sometimes we're shocked and befuddled and deeply saddened by the sins of God's people. And we can't believe that some of the sheep have done the things that they have done. They've broken our hearts and they've caused us a lot of problems. But brothers... We don't have nearly as close an acquaintance with the sins of God's people as we have with our own sins. Nothing is so disappointing to us as our own failures, the way we think at times, the anger we feel, the covetousness, the jealousy, the spite. It's inexcusable. We preach against it, and we're doing it. Well, whether we're struggling with our own sins or the sins of the sheep, we know, we preach, that there is forgiveness in Christ. And that forgiveness is because of the infinitely valuable satisfaction that he rendered on the cross to the justice of God. So in the presence of sin, whether it's ours or someone else's, we must preach the gospel. We must preach the gospel to ourselves. That's what the gospel is for. It's for sinners. And maybe you're dealing with a saint. Well, you used to think they were a saint. And they've fallen into a very deep ditch. And you were, you're disappointed And part of the disappointment is because of what that says about your ministry, which you don't want to face. But you're disappointed. And the temptation is to want to take the law and grind them to powder. But let's suppose they know they've sinned. They know they've messed up. They don't deny it. They're sorrowful over it. Well, the law won't help them. What they need is a gospel. And you may say, I just don't feel like giving good news to that guy right now. That's what you give to yourself when you fail, right? What do you do to yourself when you have blown it big time? You preach the gospel to yourself, I hope. And that's what you should do to that brother or sister who has broken your heart and perhaps the hearts of the church. If the law has done its work and they have been wounded and they have been brought to confession, give them lavish doses of the gospel. And when you're in a period of discouragement, I I would strongly encourage you to run to certain authors that have proven under God to be a balm to your soul. And there are writers in my experience, that are better at applying the medicine of the gospel than other writers. Uh, Octavius Winslow, John Newton, Samuel Rutherford, that's a few, J.C. Ryle, Spurgeon. We need to learn to preach the gospel the way they preach the gospel to us. But there are, there are writers, when you're sliding into a fog, that you need to read. And personal declension and the revival of religion and the soul is a great book. Antidote number two. Christ didn't call us for failure. He didn't call us for failure. He called us to accomplish things under his blessing. We must labor optimistically. We must labor with hope and expectation. 
John 15, 7 and 8, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask, the Father in my name, he may give you. Those are wonderful promises, and they weren't just for the 12. The implication is that that is true of all of those who are called to labor in the gospel. If Christ has called us, he has called us to be successful. I, as far as I know, I, I don't think any of us should see ourselves as New Covenant Jeremiah's who have been called to, who have been called to God to tear down and destroy and who have been told nobody's going to listen to you. That's not how we should view our calling. We have been sent to make disciples. We have been sent to be the instruments by which Christ builds his church. New Covenant ministers should work in hope and with resilient faith. But we have to be sure that we're using the proper tools. And the proper tools, you know what they are. It's, it's the whole counsel of God with a peculiar gospel focus. Our calling is not to foster theological movements disconnected from the gospel. We ought to be theologians, and we ought to be unembarrassed theologians, and we ought to be good theologians. But we've got to use theology to preach the gospel and to show the glory of God in the gospel. We're sent to proclaim good news. That's what God will bless. We must not permit ourselves to get knocked off message. The third piece of counsel, and this has been perhaps the, the last rope that I've grabbed to just before I went over the edge. Christ himself has appointed the ultimate outcome of your ministry. Or you can put it another way, the doctrine of predestination. We must be faithful every aspect of our calling, especially our handling of the scripture in public and private. But we must also live with the objective reality that the outcome of our ministries is beyond our control. We can't find the elect. We can't heal the diseases of God's people. We apply the only remedy. You've got to be convinced of that. There's not another remedy. It's a remedy of the gospel. It's a remedy of the whole counsel of God. We apply the remedy, but that's all we can do. The Lord has called us for success, and he's determined exactly what that success will be. And the outcome of our ministries was determined before we were called. None of us can bear the weight of ultimate responsibility. It's not all on you. You're a steward. You're a steward. The work is his. That's so basic, but it's, if you forget that, you become a manipulator or you go over the edge into despair. The only adequate plan for defeating mysterious and pastoral discouragement is to be purposefully, unrelentingly focused upon the living Christ, his work, his power, his promises. Striving for a Christ-centered ministry, it, guys, that's, that's not simply a sweet, pious-sounding cliche. A thoughtful, intentional, Christ-focused ministry is simply what New Covenant ministry is. And that's what we must be for the sake of our own souls and for the sake of everyone who hears us. 
Well, finally, um, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but we finally get to the third theme. <laughs> and I really have to say everything I'm going to say because my last theme is, is one that I want to try to get in completely. Okay. The next theme is a pastor with his sermon. Now we're coming to the second part of Paul's directive in 2 Timothy 4.16. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Now, it's, you know the term doctrine may refer either to the act of teaching or to the content that is taught. And I suppose it's a cop-out, but I, I think it's best to assume that Paul has both of those things in view. Take heed to what you say and take heed to how you say it. Now, in terms of function and focus, the essence of the pastor's labor can be defined as the Word of God in prayer. Acts 6.4. The apostles were called upon to resolve a, a very serious dispute in the church. It had to do with benevolence. You know the story. And they appointed that the church would look out among themselves and find spirit-filled men that would be appointed to do that work, and they would give their, themselves to the Word of God and prayer. The quality of every pastor's service to God and to men is determined by what happens in private. The quality of every pastor's service to God and to men is determined by what happens in private. And perhaps I'm wrong, but it's my impression that certain modern paradigms of ministry are putting pressure on pastors to spend more time administrating, more time fostering movements, more time counseling, less time in private, less time in study, less time in prayer, less time in meditation. And call me old school, but I find that tendency troubling. It's my opinion that's one reason we have a plurality of pastors. Part of that is the wisdom that comes from multiple men, mature men, but part of it is to protect the public ministry of the Word of God. That those men who labor in the Word publicly may be protected in a legitimate way. Not that they don't engage the sheep, they do. But there has to be time set aside for meditation and prayer and exegetical work. Now our private labors ought to be dominated by three very large concerns. Number one, maintaining an increasing, an accurate understanding of the Bible. Maintaining, we can lose what we know or what we used to know, right? Maintaining and enlarging, growing, increasing, an accurate understanding of God's Word. The only thing that we have to give people that's truly good for them and useful is revealed truth. Now, a lot of things have happened with revealed truth over the centuries. Almost innumerable debates and theories have arisen concerning Christian dogma and Christian practice. And some of that material is fascinating and stimulating but the disputes and the debates over the centuries 
are really helpful to us only to the extent that we are better, we become better informed as to the actual comprehension of God's words. What is God actually saying? And sometimes working through a dispute can help you refine your understanding of the Bible. But that's what we need. We need a grasp, a better grasp of the Bible. The Church of Christ will not thrive on doctrinal theories or doctrinal schemes or systems that are man-made and artificial. The church must have the actual truth contained in the Scripture. And that's what we're to give them. And that's what we have to work hard at getting ourselves. There are probably areas right now that we're all wrong about. And I... I think it's a legitimate question. When was the last time you changed a position because of the pressure of the Bible? I'm not not talking about changing a position so you could please somebody or make life a little less stressful for yourself. That's a temptation we have to fight at times. But I'm talking about changing a position because in your fresh study of the Word of God, you came to realize you were wrong. When was the last time you actually had to say to God's people? You know, when I preached that, I really believed it. Now I realize I didn't have it exactly right. Have you ever done that? So we haven't conquered the Bible. There's still a lot we have to understand. Now, hopefully, by God's grace, we've got the big things right. And we've got the, uh, we, we've got the overall picture, the mega picture. Hopefully, we've got that right. But there are probably some areas where we need some fresh light, understanding, Consequently, our determined task must be to understand the Bible in its parts, in its entirety. And and to this end, we must do the following in sermon preparation. First, we must pray that the Holy Spirit will give grace for us to actually understand what the text we're hoping to preach actually says. We can't assume that. It's so easy to bring preconceived ideas to a text. And sometimes it's easy to reach in the file and reach for a sermon where you've handled that text in the past and just take out that old work. Well, maybe, maybe upon occasion that's necessary, but that should not be our practice. We ought to take each sermon freshly, Approach every text freshly. Re-exegete the passage. Pray over it. Don't assume you understand it. Pray that God will teach you. And then, secondly, labor in the language. Labor in the original text. Labor in the larger biblical context. Remember the overflow of biblical truth and how this text fits in the larger story. That's all involved. But then thirdly, make diligent use of the gifts that Christ has given his church down through the centuries. I don't think it's wise to begin consulting the gifts before you've prayed and sought God and begun to work in the text. Let the text formulate your judgment and then test your judgment by the gifts that Christ has given to the church. And they're available to us through their writings. It's irreverent, I think. It's dangerous for a pastor not to consult. Proven gifts, gifted teachers, if he's able to do so. Now, there are preachers in parts of the country, they don't even have whole Bibles, parts of the world. They don't even have whole Bibles. 
And they can cry out for the Holy Spirit to teach them, and they'll probably get some help that you and I won't get if all they have is their portion of the Bible and nothing else, and they pray for help. But we've got a lot more. We've got the original text. We've got all these language helps, and we've got gifted men of the past. We need to consult them. I'm sure you're a lover of good books. I I don't think I've ever met a Reformed pastor who didn't love books. That's great. But you only have so much time. Be discriminating as to the books you love best. And my encouragement would be to assign a different value to books that provide substantial help in understanding the text of Scripture as opposed to books that specialize in helping you make practical application of the Scripture. If I were commencing afresh the construction of my library, I would invest much more money in trying to accumulate the best commentaries that I could find on every book of the Bible. Now, why do I say that? Because exegeting Scripture is an objective endeavor for the most part, whereas application is more subjective and is in many occasions suited to the moment. When I was preparing for these lectures, I went back and read part of Charles Bridges' Christian ministry. It had been a long time, and I took it down and read it, and was thoroughly discouraged. <clears throat> and, and I think we, I dipped into a number of books, new and old. Many of them were discouraging. And it reminds me of a philosophy of preaching to which I used to subscribe. I don't anymore, praise God. And that is the best sermons left people in the dust. The best sermons were the sermons that left people bleeding, walking out with their heads down. I needed that, Pastor. (laughs) God have mercy. Sometimes God's people need to be bloodied a little bit so they can look at the blood that takes away their sins. But to bloody God's people because we have the power to do so. Sometimes I think men who write in the Christian ministry attempt to do that. I'm not sure that's helpful. But anyway, reading Bridges made me think, I'm not a hunter, but if I had been, I had to give up hunting. And I ought to give up sports. Now he was writing to a particular generation in which many preachers were upper-class guys who spent their time with the hounds and the foxes, and they weren't involved in the work of the ministry. But you take that application and you transfer that into the 21st century. And if you find someone who is an enthusiast for NFL football, you've found a pastor who's not doing his work, Now, I think it's more helpful to accumulate books that actually help us understand the text of Scripture and then use Matthew Henry and then use Spurgeon, then use some guys who will show you how to apply it to the heart. We must devote ourselves supremely to the Scriptures. The second large concern, that was just the first, and I'll just name the last two. We've already talked about the utter dependency we have on the blessing of Christ. Intercessory prayer. We have to pray over our sermons. And and you know what? I have found it's harder and harder to find enough time to pray over my sermons. It's the demands are so great, I have to get into the Word. I have to get into the Word. I have to extract a sermon. I'll pray later. What? There won't be a sermon worth preaching without the blessing of God. 
and there won't be any effective preaching about the blessing of God, we have to find time to pray. Thirdly, when you come to actually write your sermon, aim at three things, clarity, to be clear, to be memorable, and to be useful. You will need structure. I have a dear pastor friend. I love him to death. He's a godly man. His sermons are a stream of consciousness. He, he says some great things. I mean, he really does, memorable things. But when you get through, you don't know where you've been and you don't know where you are. If we're going to be helpful, we need to have structure. If, if it's going to be memorable, we need to have structure that people can remember. We need illustrations. I talked about my inability to do that, but we've got to work at it, not to entertain people, not to change the flow and the atmosphere. I'm going to tell a joke now to lighten things up and let you release a little bit, and then I'll get you back. No, no, not psychological manipulation, but to make truth clearer. And then finally, practical applications. Practical applications that are taken out of the text. This is not a time when you come to make applications. It's not a time for you to go after people. This is my occasion. I'm going to go after somebody. God forbid. If there's somebody you need to go after, get with them after church and go to it. But don't do it from the pulpit. Construct applications that everybody can see. That comes out of the text. And the number one application is go to Christ. Don't ever preach a sermon. Now I'm getting really dogmatic here. Don't ever preach a sermon that tells people what to do and you don't tell them to go to Christ. We're not moralists. And that's what that kind of preaching is to make great applications that get close to people and then pronounce a benediction. What are they supposed to do with that? There's only one thing they can do. Confess their sins and go to Christ and go to Christ and fetch the grace and do better. The last practical counsel, and this is very practical counsel, I encourage you to write out your sermons verbatim. Now, I'm not saying take that into the pulpit. My experience has been it's much easier for me to gain clarity and variety of expression. I used to preach extemporaneously. When I first started preaching, I had one sheet of notes, three points, and I forget what those trigger words were. <laughs> what was that supposed to remind me to say? <laughs> And then you would fall into the habits of repeating the same phrases. I think, I think, I think. How do you avoid that kind of thing? Well, I think writing out everything you're going to say, praying, thinking about people and children, and how can I say this, use variety of my, I commend it to you heartily to write out full manuscripts, and if you have a big mind, then memorize them and don't take any notes into the pulpit. <laughs> well, thank you for your patience. Let's pray. Father, we're way too weak, way too small for this work, but you knew that, and you called the likes of us, so it would be evident to everyone that the power is yours. And so, Father, support our weaknesses, defeat our frailties, and pour your power upon us and through us so that in spite of us, Christ will have great glory. We pray in his name. Amen.